for 24 hours. So I stayed home. I watched Pastor Redlin in the morning <laughs> from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock. I watched Pastor Mowers from 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock and Pastor Mowers from 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock. And so I uh, had a lot of preaching Sunday morning, and it was all good, and I uh, enjoyed it all. And uh, thanks for Pastor Myers on the, on the spur of the moment preaching for me. I appreciate that. It's tough to pull a sermon out of the out of the file and get it ready, but I'm glad you did. So thank the Lord for that. Uh, but uh, feeling better, and uh, thank you so much for your prayers. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Go ahead and stand with me, shall we? And let's go ahead and sing hymn number. Uh, let's see, what would Lewis? pick 345 who knows right 345 a new name and glory here yeah, number 345 I was once a sinner but I came pardoned to receive from my Lord this was freely given and I found that he always kept his word there's a new name written down in glory and it's mine oh yes it's mine and the white robed angels sing the story a sinner has come home for there's a new name written down in glory and it's mine oh yes it's mine with my sins forgiven I am bound for heaven nevermore to roam on the last in the book tis kneeling saved by grace oh the joy that came to my soul now i am forgiven and i know by the blood i am made whole there's a new name written down in glory and it's mine oh yes it's mine and the white robed angels sing the story a sinner has come home for there's a new name written down in glory and it's mine oh yes it's mine with my sins forgiven i am bound for heaven never more to roam father thank you for the day today thank you for your grace and your blessing us and Lord, we know a lot of the events have taken place over just the last couple days, uh, from Sunday to Wednesday, and we thank you for your help, your wisdom, your grace, your favor. And now, Lord, we know that uh, we've, we've, we've been told that some folks can't attend the church anymore from over at Pensacola Christian because of different requirements, and so we pray for them. We miss those guys and pray that you give them a special blessing and encourage them if they're watching by way of video let them know that we miss them we're glad that uh, they could watch our service but uh, lord we pray that you bless them wherever they are and then for those who are watching at home uh, either because of sickness or uh, still um, being careful about the covid virus lord please bless and encourage watch over each person Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The air condition is working, amen. Uh, I, My wife, in the middle of the service on Sunday, she said, the air's not working. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. And then, um, so I, I texted uh, Robbie uh, Monday, and they had been out of town over the weekend, and so he said he would run by and take a look at it. I think he said he was going to come by Tuesday night. And so I guess he did. So he didn't tell me if he did or not, but uh, it's working, so I'm thinking he probably did. Okay, this is from the Warrens. That's it, Debbie. We're not going to sing anymore uh, tonight. Um, I, I read this letter, and I thought, you've got to be kidding me. I told Jesse, you're going to love this Alaskan letter. But this is the Warrens to Alaska. Here you go. You ready for this one? Hang on. During February and the first half of March, before the coronavirus restrictions were implemented, we were very busy. Remember, he's in Alaska. This is winter time. I was able to go to Pilot Station twice more by snow machine to minister. Was able also to chainsaw a sled load of driftwood. Take it to a disabled man who lives in Pilot Station. Then, in late February, I went a long trip with a man who comes to church and was able to minister in three villages. The plan was to go 15 miles upriver 
on the Yukon River, stopping in Pilot Station to minister to a relative of the man who comes to church, get information on the trail conditions between Pilot Station and Marshall. There had been a blizzard the day and night before we had departed. It added one foot of fresh, soft snow to the four feet of old, hard, packed snow that we already had. Just that right there blows my mind, <laughs> all that snow. As we witnessed to and prayed for the folks in Pilot Station, we also were told that no one had traveled upriver to Marshall since the blizzard had stopped the previous night, so we would be breaking our own trail. As the forecast called for a temperature of about 20 degrees, perfect traveling conditions, warm enough to not be uncomfortable driving an average of 30 miles an hour on an open vehicle, cold enough to keep water, now here's the key, from coming up on top of the ice and permeating the snow, which causes a slush called overflow. Are you familiar with that? We were not deterred by the prospect of being the first to break the trail. After prayer, for the Lord's will and safety, we headed out on the next leg of the journey, 35 miles up the Yukon to Marshall on a snowmobile. Two of them. Within 10 miles of leaving Pilot Station, the snow started getting deeper. The weather started getting warmer than the forecast said. Eventually, the new fallen snow from the blizzard the previous 24 hours would be three feet on top of the four feet of old snow. The temperature would be well above freezing, leading to conditions ripe for deep, slushy overflow. We began getting stuck in the overflow again and again, losing count of the times we got stuck that day. Sometimes we'd be able to get unstuck in five minutes or less. Other times it would take us up to two hours. About halfway to Marshall, I noticed my traveling partner had encountered some deep overflow, and I had to make a snap decision. I couldn't go where he went as he had made a deep trench in the overflow, and I would surely get stuck. I couldn't go right because there was a hole in the ice. I couldn't stop as I was sinking in the overflow already. My only option was to go left, which appeared to be safe, but hardly had I gotten six inches out of my traveling partner's tracks when I ran into an ice upheaval hidden by the new snow. I went from 30 miles an hour to a dead stop. I miraculously received no injury, but we had to get my snow machine out of the overflow before it sank. After 15 minutes, we were able to free it from the overflow, which included mud oozing up through the cracks in the ice, leave it to a Florida man to get muddy in the middle of an Alaskan winter. <laughs> My firearm fell in the overflow. With a couple of minutes of getting it out, I had a half an inch of frozen mud coating it. Assessing the damage, my cowling on the snow machine had exploded like a hand grenade. And in places, the frame was warped and broken. The engine and track were still functioning, but the front suspension was severely damaged with the left ski pointing 45 degrees out from straight. The handlebar is very crooked as well. After some judicious pounding with my hatchet and some liberal application of bailing wire, zip ties, and duct tape, we continued at somewhat slower pace to, pace to Marshall. It would usually take about an hour and a half to snow machine from Pilot Station to Marshall, but it took us eight hours. We stayed the night at a friend's house in Marshall, getting some hot meals in our bellies, dry clothes on our backs, and some much-needed rest. As we were punched drunk with exhaustion from wrestling over 600 pounds of machine and equipment out of overflow time after time, we were able to minister many people in the village that evening. <laughs> Can you imagine how rough that was? As many came to visit, considering it was a miracle we had made it, let's go see this guy. The elders had only seen snow like this once in their lifetime, in the early 90s. Uh, we, had, we had a service in the living room, and I was able to share my testimony. The next morning, we continued about another 100 miles to Bethel. Having been given information, the trail between Marshall and Bethel was much better. With less snow and no overflow, it only took us eight hours to travel 100 miles to Bethel. There is a ski do dealership in Bethel, and they totaled my machine. My friend had to leave his machine there as well for repairs, so after a night's rest, we flew back to St. Mary's. 
with my other snow machine having a blown engine and this one a total loss that left me without a snow machine to continue the circuit ministry to other villages. But the Lord bless, we have been able to purchase one new snow machine with our sending church, Independent Baptist Church of Anchorage, Remote Alaskan Missions, RAM, and many other churches and individuals giving towards the need. It should arrive in April, Lord willing, which this is a late letter. Rebecca and Nathan flew to Florida for one of her sister's weddings in early March, and as she was about to travel back, RAVN, the small airlines company that flies from the road system of Alaska to St. Mary's, went bankrupt. The village of St. Mary's enacted a travel ban trying to keep the coronavirus out of the village. Really? Is it all the way up in Alaska? Man. The village is its own little country. The village council has restricted everyone to stay at home except for necessary trips to the store and post office, snow machine trips with only one family to do subsistence activities such as hunt, get firewood, ice fish. Anyone breaking of these, any breaking of these mandates will result in a hefty fine and repeat offenders can be banished from the village. As a result, Jubal, Kezia, and I have been cooped up with not even a snow machine to get out and do substance, subst subsistence activities with, with, pray for our sanity. RAVN going bankrupt has ended daily flights for passengers and mail. For a long time being, we only get two cargo flights a week from Linden Air Cargo because no passenger flights are coming out. When our communication system goes down, no one can fly out to fix it. So our email prayer letters have been infrequent. With mail coming in twice a week, weather permitting, we have not been able to get office supplies here reliably during these months to mail out prayer letters. Because of these inconveniences, we are going from a monthly news and prayer letter to a bi-monthly one. We apologize, but it has become necessary during these times. Two souls have been saved during these hectic months. A teenage boy who moved to St. Mary's a year ago has been coming to church. A teenage girl who has been coming to Sunday school and VBS since we moved here Praise God. Pray for the growth in the Lord. Special thanks to those who've helped us with VBS these past three summers. The girl clearly knew the gospel, what it meant for her as a sinner, and she was eager to put her faith and trust in the Lord for salvation. These are the first teenagers to call on the Lord for salvation since we moved to St. Mary's. Praise the Lord. Wow. What a story, huh? He needs to start a journal so he can start writing those things down. All right, let's pray for them. Thank you, Lord, for the, the Warrens and Israel and Rebecca and the kids, Lord, thank you for the way you've watched over them. I can't even imagine being in the situation he was in. In the middle of the wilderness, uh, the snow and the cold and your machine breaks down. And Lord, I thank you for not only the talent and the skill, the wherewithal, the wisdom, the pioneering understanding, mechanics, all that you have given him through his father, through others and just through experience in his life here in Florida, all these things he's learned. And then to go up there and live in the wilderness, Lord, thank you for that, but also thank you for his faith. Thank you for his faith to know that he can do anything in Jesus Christ. And to be able to go to the village of Marshall and then after being worn out, still be able to minister so thank you for his tenacity and his strength. And so, Lord, I pray for him. I pray for Rebecca. I pray for the kids that you just help them. I'm not sure exactly where they are right now. The letter's a, a little bit old, as he just explained. It's hard to get them out now. And we pray that he, he will be doing well, that he would be able to get everything he needs uh, for his ministry. So bless them. Keep them safe. And we pray that you'd open up the doors of communication, of travel, of flight, cargo, delivery, all that's needed, that somehow, Lord, these things will be replaced. And we'll thank you for all you're going to do. Thank you for our missions program. We pray you'd help us to be stronger and more motivated than ever before. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, let's take our Bibles, and I want to tell you one thing more. Last week, we started a new series, and it's really a topical series of simply called one thing more. And it's basically my attempt to go through the scriptures and basically share with you stories that you already know, but maybe are unfamiliar with some of the details. And so as you turn to 2 Samuel chapter 4, last week we talked about David. 
and um, we kind of looked at how, I'm sorry, Joseph, and how Joseph was a type of Christ. Not, it was just not only about Joseph and his coat of many colors and that type of thing, but there's more to it than that. And so we shared with you one thing more and how he was a great type of Christ. And so tonight, I would like to do the same. I'd like to take a subject, a title, a topic, or at least a, in this case, another man. Sometimes we will be taking subjects, theological discussions, but tonight I want to talk to you about something the Lord laid in my heart. About a week ago, about a week ago, we are reading 2 Samuel chapter 4 uh, for our Wednesday reading, a week ago. And as I was meditating on the passage in 2 Samuel chapter 4, the Lord laid some things on my heart. I wrote down a few notes, and throughout the week I've been thinking and praying. And I want to share with you one thing more regarding David and Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. That's an unusual name. It's one that you might remember from your Old Testament reading. I have preached on it be him before, but there's not a lot about Mephibosheth in the Bible, but there's some profound things I want to show you tonight to expand your mind, also to make you appreciate what God has done. So let's start with 2 Samuel chapter 4 and one verse, and then we're going to jump to chapter 9. 2 Samuel chapter 4 and verse 4 says, And Jonathan, that's David's best friend, Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. They had died at the battle of Mount Gilboa with the Philistines. So when news came back, his nurse, keep reading, took him up and fled, and rightfully so. King Saul is dead. Prince Jonathan, the heir, is dead. Now the heir's son is only five years old. The nurse picks him up, and she made haste to flee that she, he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. So one thing we already know is this guy started off in the lap of luxury and privilege. He was the grandson of the king. Had everything handed to him taken care of, no issues at all in life. At five years of age, things were going great. But then on that fateful day, when the news came that Saul was dead, Jonathan was slain, and the Philistines were overrunning the country. And then now what's going to happen? The nurse picked up the grandson and fled. And when she did, she dropped him. And the Bible says that he became lame in his feet. Now turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 9. We'll pick up the story. In this passage, David is now the king. And I'm going to fill in the blanks in just a minute. David is now the king. He does not know Jonathan had a son. David, by the time this is written, has been king for quite a while. Probably 20 years, I'm guessing. Somewhere around there. Now, In a minute, I'll show you why. So David, being king now, for 20 of the 40 years he's going to reign... He says, is there anyone else that I can be a blessing to the house of Saul? Notice what he says, verse 1. Is there any that is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? There was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba, and when the king they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? He said, Yes. Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son. He's lame on his feet. All of this time, David did not know that. Had no clue. Why? Why? We'll explain that in a minute. So now verse 4. The king said, Where is he? Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodibar. Now, Machir, the house of Machir, this guy is an ardent supporter of David. 
He loves David. Matter of fact, when David will flee Absalom, which you probably just read today in your reading, right? When he flees Absalom, one of the people that help David immensely is Machir. He loves David. So here's this guy, Mephibosheth. He's not living anywhere near the land of Saul, Jonathan. Other people are taking that. Where is this guy? Where is Mephibosheth? He is in the land of Lodibar. The king sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodibar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face. He did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not. Now, I want to talk to you about one thing more about Mephibosheth. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to share. We thank you for the scriptures. We pray, Father, that you help us to see the, the, the really profound and, and just wonderful truths tonight about David and Mephibosheth and how this story truly is our story. Everyone sitting here tonight is Mephibosheth. Help us to see that tonight, Lord. One thing more, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. See, David was a great example of the man after God's own heart. We know that, right? We also know that David wanted to do God's will to honor God. And, of course, we know the greatest story of all time seems to be in the Old Testament. David and who? Goliath, right? It catapulted David into the category of God's greatest men, one of God's greatest men, one of the Bible's greatest stories. And we know that by the time all of this is written, Saul and his sons, he had four sons, Saul had four sons, Jonathan was his oldest, then there was Abinadab, and then there was Melchishua, and then there was Ishbosheth. All these four sons and Saul met, well, not Ishbosheth, he stayed back, because should Saul and Jonathan and Abinadab and Melchishua get killed, There'd still be one to take the throne, and that was Ishbosheth. So he stayed back. But Saul and the three oldest sons went to fight the Philistines, and we know from the witch of Endor, remember that story where Samuel said, tomorrow you're going to die. And Saul is going to die on Mount Gilboa. The battle was sore, fought. The Philistines overran them. And the Bible tells us that Saul was hit by an arrow from an archer. And he said to his armor bearer, I am sorely wounded. I do not want to be abused by these Philistines. Take your sword and kill me. And his armor bearer said, I can't do it. And so he didn't do it. So Saul then took his own sword and he fell on his own sword. The armor bearer does the same thing. In, in the battles nearby... The sons are killed as well. David gets word of that. He didn't go to that battle. And now David becomes king. He's king in Hebron first. Then he becomes king over all of Israel. And things are going quite well. David never knew that Jonathan had a son. Now why is that? Probably because remember when David was fleeing Saul, he and Jonathan only met for two times. And then David was gone for years. Years had gone by. So it could be very easily understood that Jonathan, after he said goodbye to David, oh, a son was born, David never heard about it. There was no Facebook or what do they do that, you know, a revealing of the gender. He didn't do any of that, right? He couldn't have seen that. So as far as David's concerned, he didn't know. He just knows that Saul and Jonathan are dead. He's now the king. And I want you to see something about David. We're told that now David becomes this really great, great uh, leader. And so let me give you number one, the record of David. The record of David. 
look at verse, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 8. You have to see this, this and it'll, it'll, it'll lay a foundation for what else I'm going to tell you in a minute. But in 2 Samuel chapter 8, look at verse 13. David gave him a name when he returned from smiting of the Syrians in the Valley of Salt, being 18,000 men. Look at verse 15. David reigned over all Israel. David executed judgment and justice unto all his people. Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was over the host. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahiud, was the recorder. Zadok, the son of Ahitub. Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were the priests. Zeruiah was a scribe. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites. And David's sons were chief rulers. I mean, David had established himself. He was the great king. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, two chapters earlier, he, God spoke to him, gave him the Davidic covenant. As far as David is concerned, this is the life. He's, he's got the throne. He's defeating all of his enemies. Everything is under control. His administration is just right. His budgets are being met. Everything is going great. And he looks out in a time of meditation. And he says, chapter 9, verse 1, Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I could be a blessing to? Because he realizes he took over from the house of Saul. So in the record of David's life, someone says now, Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth. We understand now that, notice verse 1. Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness? Now everybody look at the last two words, or three words. For Jonathan's what? Sake. See, David wanted to be a blessing for Jonathan's sake. That's important to remember. For Jonathan's sake. Also, we understand, take a look if you will, to verse 7, he says it again. David said, Fear not, for I will show, surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. See, little Mephibosheth at five years of age was dropped. When he was 12, David became the king, we understand. Now how old is he? Well, if you keep reading... Take a look, if you will, at verse uh, 12 of chapter 9. Mephibosheth had a young son. So Mephibosheth is now at least, we're guessing, somewhere in his 20s, maybe upper 20s. And he's married. Although he can't walk, he's married. He's lame. He probably walks roughly, but he's lame and he has a son. David knew none of this. But for Jonathan's sake, David wanted to be a blessing to someone, and he found out it just happened to be Mephibosheth. Do you understand this thought? Think about this. I said earlier that we are all Mephibosheth. Do you understand that the blessing that we have in salvation comes because of someone else's sake? We have salvation not because of ourselves. We have the blessing from the Father, David, if you will, David wanted to bless someone for the, the, the sake of Jonathan. We get salvation for the sake of Jesus. We are the Mephibosheth. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Why did he forgive you? For Christ's sake. Why did David have mercy on Mephibosheth? For Jonathan's sake. Not Mephibosheth. I didn't even know him. God know, doesn't even know us. But for Jesus' sake, he forgives us. See, how we're, see the beauty of this? This one more thing. We hear the story about Mephibosheth, but one thing more we understand is that we are the Mephibosheth. I like what the songwriter said, his life for mine. Listen to the words. His heart was broken. Mine was mended. He became sin, now I am clean. The cross he carried bore my burden. The nails that had held him set me free. And then the chorus, his life for mine. His life for mine. How could it ever be that he would die, God's son would die, to save a wretch like me? What love divine he gave his life for mine. Listen to John 16, 23. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, Jesus says, for my sake, in my name, he'll give it you. See, the reason why we get all of this, the reason why we get salvation, answers to prayer, all that God gives to us is for Jesus' sake. That's why. Do you see the picture? 
the one thing more that the record of David and Jonathan allows the provided the access for Mephibosheth. And God the Father sending his son, and for the son's sake, he provides salvation for us. That's number one. Number two, the realm of Mephibosheth. Where did he live? Take a look at this, guys. This is the second Samuel again. We know that in chapter 4 and verse 4, he was dropped by his nurse while she was fleeing. We see a physical infirmity. See, Mephibosheth had a physical infirmity. Physical. Everybody say physical. And so now the new king comes on the scene. And why did the nurse run? See, the, why would the nurse, if you get this word that King Saul is dead, Jonathan is dead, Abinadab is dead, Melchishua is dead, the nurse just grabs the baby and flees. Why? The Philistines were miles away from the capital down there where they were in Benjamin. So why flee? A couple reasons. One, maybe she was fearing the Philistines, but probably more than anything else, she was fearing David. Who did Saul try to kill on a number of occasions? David. During the last months of Saul's life, what was he doing trying to kill David? He was taking thousands of his own men and going away for months, hunting down David in the fields and in the caves and the rocks and couldn't find him. And you'd imagine what the dinner table must have been like. The conversation topic around the dinner table when Saul would get back. Hey, David, hey, David, he's going to take the kingdom. He's going to take over. He's going to take it from Jonathan. He's going to take it from you, Melchishua. He's going to take it from you. He's going to take it from you. Saul looked at the little five-year-old grandson and said, Mephibosheth, he's going to take it from you. you. I guarantee you that was probably what the table was like. How do I know that? Because that's what he said in front of Jonathan when David was sitting right there. You son of the rebellious woman, Jonathan, don't you know he wants your throne? This was typical. So the nurse hears that Saul is dead, Jonathan is dead, all the brothers are dead except for Ishbosheth, and she says, I've got to run. David is coming. And she does. Mephibosheth was brought up that way in fear of David, no doubt. That's why David didn't know who he was. He had a physical infirmity and he had a fearful existence. In chapter 9, verse 1 again, David didn't even know who, that Jonathan had a son. They kept it from him. Think about that. They kept it from him. The knowledge was kept from David. Mephibosheth did not live openly as who he really was. Saul's land was still there. Saul's house was still there. The kingdom of Saul was there. David took over Jerusalem. So all that still belonged to Saul. Who was running it? Ziba. Others. We know there are other relations of Saul that were there. Remember the one that threw stones at David when he's fleeing Absalom and he curses him? When he, that was a member of Saul's family. But Mephibosheth, where was he? He wasn't there. He was living a fearful existence with a physical infirmity and forsaken by his family. They were letting him live somewhere else, taking over his property. Mephibosheth had nothing. He had his young son living with somebody else and simply in a place called Lodibar. The Bible says Lodibar, it's actually a place of barrenness or a place without pasture where you cannot grow things. Saul had all the wonderful property, but not Mephibosheth, who should have had it, but was so afraid of David he lived with his physical infirmity, with the fearful existence, and this forsaken by his family. And so David fetches him. Look at verse 5. The king sent and fetched him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel from Lobedavar. And now when Mephibosheth saw the son of uh, Jonathan, son of Saul, was come, he fell on his face. He did reverence. And notice the first words that David says to him in verse 7. After he calls his name out, David said unto him, verse 7, Fear not, because he knows what he's got to be thinking. Why would he come get me? I've been hiding all of this time. What does David want? By the way, what is, who is David at this time? He hadn't sinned with Bathsheba yet. That's coming. 
What a, he was, he has established himself. He has put down the Ammonites. He's put down the Hittites. He's put down the Philistines. I mean, in a vigorous way, slaughtering way. David is known as this one. When men come to David and say, hey, I killed Saul. Here's this crown. David said, kill that man. Slaughter him right in front of me. In this very chapter, in, in the, you're going to find when they bring Ishbosheth's head to him, David says, kill that man. David has no problem with seeing bloody mess right in front of him. Mephibosheth knows that. What does David want with me? And David says, fear not. And he says these words, I'm going to show you kindness for your father Jonathan's sake. Unreason I mean, unreal. One thing more. I need to hasten on. Ephesians 2.12 tells us this. Now listen now. That at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, forsaken, if you will, no hope without God in the world. See, we have this striking parallel, don't we? We are like Mephibosheth in that sense as well. We are just like him. We are without hope. We are full of infirmity of our flesh, if you will, our sinful nature. We are separated from the king. And we are fearful about God. And then number three, the relationship of David. Let me review those points again with you if you're writing them down. Number one, the record of David, the realm of Mephibosheth. And now number three, quickly, the relationship of David and Mephibosheth. And really, this is the rest of it. You can read it. In verse 7 through 13, David said, Fear not, I'm going to show you kindness for Jonathan, thy father's sake. Restore thee all the land of, thy, of Saul, thy father. You get it all. You're going to eat bread at my table continually. He bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon a dead dog as I am? The king called Ziba, the servant of Saul. I have given unto your master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. I, get, I, I tell you, my thought is that Ziba was running it all, and now he just gave it to Mephibosheth and said, You run it for him. All your sons, and he had a bunch of them, 15 sons and 20 servants. And he says, you're going to till the land for him. You're going to bring him the fruits. So his family will have plenty to eat. Then verse 11, he says, Ziba says, yes, sir. And that's what you say to David. You don't say anything else but yes, sir, right? And then David says, as for Mephibosheth, look at verse 11 at the end. He shall eat, where guys? At my table as one of what? Do you realize what Jesus has done for us? He has brought us into the table of fellowship with God. God, for Jesus' sake, says, I want you to sit at my table and be one of my sons. Do you see it? Do you see that? Do you have spiritual eyes to see that with? Everything was restored. He eats at the king's table. One thing more. Ephesians chapter 2, and I'll close with this. If you'll turn over to... Well, before we do, look at 13, verse 13. Mephibosheth ate continually at the king's table and was lame on both of his feet. Keep that in mind. Even though he got all of this, he was still lame. Now go over to Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse 4. Look at the parallel here. One thing more. The story of Mephibosheth is not just a story in the Old Testament. There is so much that parallels us. Ephesians 2, 4, follow, just think about all we just said. God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. Like from Mephibosheth, by grace he was brought up. Hath raised us up together, made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus at the table, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. But Phibosheth, it's not of you, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus and the good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, 
called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh by, made by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of province, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. That's the one thing more. One last thought. There's still, though, the dependence of Mephibosheth on the blessing of David. See, he sat at the king's table, but he was still lame at his feet. We, as Christians, we fellowship with Jesus every day. We sit at the table of his grace. But I still carry that old nature. And I am dependent on him every day. I may be sitting at the table of grace, but I am so dependent. I'm still lame in my soul because I still have my old nature and I need Jesus every day. What a great thing. One thing more. Okay, Pastor Mark. And we'll go to 10 10. I think it'll be enough time. Any praises to start our evening off with this evening? Ms. Teresa? Uh oh. So I have literally retired my family to pray with them. Oh, wow. And I am so sad to leave them. And I know that this is a great opportunity to do so, and I feel like I'm doing it. <laughs> and so, but yet, it's, it's something that I can really hang on to and really look back to. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Pastor Davis. Just praise the Lord for everything. You know, every event I've, I've had to that's been sent into the hospital where it's a long visit. I go through this leg, x ray it again, and uh, it's an initial part of blood vessel tumor. It's above the tibia, up the tibia. Tip, tip, tip. And uh, it's an idea that they're having a myopsis in it. Amen. For those at home, it's a praise that Aaron does not have to have surgery uh, for his uh, fracture. Anybody else tonight? Joyce? awesome to be able to praise the Lord for a godly mother-in-law, though it ruins one's ability to tell mother-in-law jokes. Uh, any prayer requests this evening? Becky. I thought we already knew you got the position for your position. So, so we un knew that we, you got the position for your position? So we need to pray that you get the position for your position. All right. I mean, it's it's just like any other situation where you're dealing with the government. I mean, they kind of just do things. So pray for Becca. Um, she had to interview for the job that she has that we thought she uh, was secure in. Um, and it seems to be that she probably will be okay, but pray for that. Josh. Amen. Praise the Lord.
Sure, yeah. So praise the Lord. Uh, Josh did timing chains on his car, and uh, even if you've done them 10,000 times when you turn that key and it starts, you always praise the Lord. Um, so praise the Lord for that. Um, uh, and he is going to have an interview tomorrow, um, so pray uh, for that, that that goes well. But then he has uh, ponied up a significant amount of cash to be able to take a test, and that was supposed to be on Saturday. So pray as he reschedules. Um, that he'll be able to recall all of these things uh, for this test because um, it is not just expensive but kind of a critical key uh, for him to continue doing the job that he wants to do. Uh, Ron. Uh, if you continue to pray for that time, uh, um, if you continue to pray, pray as you like, then then it will uh, be taken and uh, healed and separated from the old one. For sure. Ms. Teresa. For sure. So Ms. Teresa uh, may have an opportunity um, to kind of take custody of and, and the raising of her grandson. She's just praying for wisdom, uh, her great-grandson, that the, the Lord would be in that. All right. We don't see any more hands, and I am out of time, so let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father God, Lord, we want to come before you. And thank you, as Pastor Davis pointed out tonight, that we have access to the throne of grace, uh, not because of something that we've done, not because we've earned it, not because um, we're worthy of it, but, Father, because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. And we thank you um, for that opportunity to be able to come into the throne room of God, um, a God who is alive, a God who has all power, a God who is looking forward to being able to show himself strong on our behalf, a God who loves to give his children good gifts. Lord, as I come before you tonight, Father, I ask um, that I would not be heard for my much speaking, Father, but I ask that you would hear um, these prayers and that you would be able to bring honor and glory to your Son, and that you would increase our faith as a church as you answer these prayers. Lord, we thank you for the prayers that you've already answered, Father. Um, we thank you for the grace um, that you were able to give Miss Teresa to have to take some major steps backwards on her progress. Lord, we thank you for the fact that that Aaron does not have to have surgery. Father, we thank you uh, for Joyce's mother-in-law and the good godly example that she is. And Father, I thank you for my own mother-in-law and for the example that she is not only to me, uh, to my wife, but to my children. Lord, I thank you for the other godly ladies in my life. Father, we think of Timothy um, and how his mother and grandmother were a huge impact on him. And Lord, I thank you for my mother and my grandmother and my great-grandmother and the impact that they've had on me. Uh, Father, we ask that you would be with Becca, Lord, as uh, we thought that uh, her job was secure and squared away. Uh, Lord, she had to interview for it. So, Lord, we just ask that you would help that uh, to go uh, well and that they would let her know quickly um, that she does indeed have her job. Lord, we thank you for helping Josh to be able to knock out those timing chains. Father, we thank you for providing him with some, uh, some work now. Lord, we ask that you be with him as he has the interview tomorrow morning. And, Father, we ask that as he takes that test, you just recall, uh, help him to be able to recall all the things that he's studied and the, the classes that he's taken. And, Lord, that the questions would make sense and that they wouldn't be trick questions. And, Father, that you would help him to be able to do well um, and to be able to pass this the first time. Lord, we ask that you be with Miss Teresa, uh, Father, um, her opportunity to, uh, to raise her great-grandson. Lord, we ask that you give her much wisdom and that you'd help it to be a very clear um, decision for her and that your will would be known. Lord, we just thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to meet together as a church. Father, we thank you for the technology that we have that allows those who can't be here to be uh, in person to still um, feel your Holy Spirit moving through your word and through prayer. Lord, we ask that you'll be with us now um, as we move into a business meeting. Father, we ask that even our business meeting will bring honor and glory to your name. In your name we pray. Amen. Joe, if you want to go ahead and pass out your forms there. We had a meeting last night at the uh, with our